Hello ladies and gentlemen, who's ready for a journey of spooks and chills and scary things? Uh, today I'm going to play House of Hell for the first time. Well, for the first time recording it, I've played this a few times. Anyways, um, so yeah. Uh, one thing I should mention is that um, the company that's been making these, they kind of sort of hit a rough patch. So they stopped making individual books, and now they just have like an all in one. But then you don't get this kind of stuff with like achievements, and so that's kind of sad. But anyways, away we go. House of Ho is a fighting fantasy game book. An interactive adventure in which you are the hero. Can you? You can only win by choosing the correct path, finding equipment, avoiding traps, surviving combat. House of Hell is a little different from other fighting fantasy adventures. You start your adventure on arm. That's not true. A few, a few of them do, but whatever. With no provisions or potions, you have to avoid being frightened to death. So yeah, uh, there actually are other books where you don't have any like weapons or equipment at the beginning. However, this one does have the fear mechanic. Anyways, before starting House of Hell, you must choose one of three difficulty settings. This game book has been designed for up optimum challenge on hardcore and medium difficulty modes. For newcomers to fighting fantasy, we recommend medium or free read. Hardcore. Play hard play House of Hell exactly how Steve Jackson designed it. Nothing has been changed from the printed version. Your <clears throat> your starting skill is calculated by rolling d6 plus 6 with a negative 3 modifier added at the beginning of the adventure due to being unarmed. Your starting stamina is calculated by rolling 2d oh yeah, that's it. 2 2 d6 plus 12 and your starting luck is calculated by rolling 1d 6 plus 6 and you have a maximum fear value. <clears throat> That is calculated by rolling a 1d6 plus 6. There are unlimited bookmarks for you too, which act like placing your fingers between the pages. <clears throat> Media mode. Place, play House of Hell with a little help. Your starting stamina is calculated by throwing 2d6 plus 24, and your maximum fear is calculated by rolling 1d6 plus 9. There is no skill penalty at the beginning of the adventure. As with, hard, ugh, as with hardcore mode, you are also given unlimited bookmarks. The difficulty is ideal for more casual readers who just want a level, want a level of challenge. Free read mode. Play House of Hell like an old school cheater, using the same initials, stamina, stand, and luck in maximum fear as hardcore mode. Free read gives you three options to easily negotiate your way through the book. The back button. Turn back time. You can you can move backwards to a previous page. Should you take the wrong decision, you can now go back and choose another path. Free choice button. <clears throat> you can unlock all the links iris irrespective of whether they are available so you can easily negotiate tricky parts of the story where you require certain items. Yeah basically like god mode. Just god mode. Heal mode you're able to heal yourself at any time and you will never run out of stamina. <clears throat> Which difficulty will you choose? Well since I'm because of a, I'm a fucking masochist. Uh, hardcore. You have chosen hardcore. Before embarking on your adventure, you must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses to see how brave, lucky, resourceful you are. You must use dice to determine your initial skill, stamina, and luck. Your skill score reflects your general fighting experience. The higher the better. Your starting skill is determined by rolling a single die and adding six to the value. Roll your starting skill. Mm, could be better, but could be worse. Total of time. You begin House of Hell with no weapon. You start off the adventure with three deducted from your initial skill. Next, to determine your stamina. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination and courage. The higher the stamina score, the longer you'll be able to survive. Your starting stamina is determined by rolling two dice and adding two to that number. Roll your starting stamina. I can't see that number. But it says it's a twelve. It's a ton. Okay, not too shabby. Now your luck. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are, and evil are facts of 
Life in the devilish demand you're about to export. Your starting luck is determined by rolling one die and adding six to that number. Roll your starting luck. I cannot see what this just rolled. This can't be a good sign. This cannot be a good sign. The dice just flew off the screen and I got it too. Wow. This playthrough is officially cursed. The dice just flew off the map. Cool. And now, fear. As well as surviving your adventure by ensuring your stamina never drops below zero. In House of Hell, you must also avoid being frightened to death. Roll on die and add six to determine your fear. Ooh, noise. Six plus six, total of 12. This total will give you a maximum fear score that you can bear. Your fear score is the number of points you can take before being frightened to death. Good luck, you'll need it. So yeah, uh, maximum fear and decent stamina. Okay, the rain splatters the windshield. Wait, hold on. Okay. The rain splatters the windshield brilliantly. You can see no more than watery gloom as as you strain forward, forward over. Oh my God, the words, the words. Over the steering wheel to see the road ahead. Although the wipers flap valiantly, they are fighting a losing battle. As the rain drives harder and harder, your foot eases off the accelerator. The headlights struggle to light up the road. Damn. You cursed the white-haired old man who sent you off this bumpy track. Probably he meant the second turn on the left, or even a right turn. The old fool. Perhaps this is a, his idea of a joke. After all, he, didn't you notice a mischievous glint in his eye? Something vaguely sinister? But what sort of nonsense is this? So you've taken the wrong turn and got caught in the downpour in the night. That rain will ease off soon. You can't possibly keep up the deluge for long. And then you'll be able to... Watch out! You spin the wheel frantically to the left to avoid the figure who, from nowhere, shows up in the headlights. The car bumps and jolts as it bounces over the rocky roadside and thumps into a ditch. You collect your thoughts. You are unhurt but shaken. You remember what? Then you remember what happened. The body. You must have hit the figure that appeared. There was no way you could have avoided him. You spring out of the car, praying that he is still alive. Your clothes are soaking are soaking up the rain as you hobble back to the road. In the darkness, it is difficult to see anything, but there is no sign of a body. You consider the situation. Are you certain it was someone and not a trick of your light? Yes. Do you remember the arms flailing in fright as the car collided and the look of anguish on his face? His face. There was something familiar about that face. A man you recognized. An old man with white hair. Your heart leaps. No, impossible. With a shiver of fear, you race back to the car, jump inside, force the key into the ignition, and twist it violently. The starter coughs, sp sputters, and dies. You hit the key again, but this time a single shutter is all the engine can manage. You grasp the wheel with your hands, shake it desperately as if trying to force some life into the car. But the battery's dead. Your car is certainly not budging from this ditch tonight. Your situation is hopeless. But now the plight of your car is paramount. Where can you get help? You pass a garage at Middleford, Mingleford, but that was some 20 miles ago. As if in an answer, a light appears in the distance. Someone switched on a bedroom light. What a stroke of luck. It was at least 15 miles back that you passed the last house, and you happened to have broken down just short of, just a short distance from someone's house. You button up your coat, open the door, from outside the car, you can see the building more clearly. Just ahead, on the left, a drive winds up to a large house. It is a good five minutes walk away. And by the time you reach it, you will be drenched. But how else can you call it the garage? By the way, this is, these are written in uh, jolly old England in the 70s. So yeah, garage is actually a mechanic. <clears throat> you can't afford to miss tomorrow's appointment. No, you must. You go, no, you... Oh, Jesus Christ. The words, no, go, you must. Anyways, you'll probably be able to dry off inside and inside phoning the garage. You slam the door, turn up the collar, and set off for the house. A flash of lightning, of lightning lights up, lights it up clearly for your butt, and your preoccupation with the rain, the warning from above is wasted on you. The house is old, 
very old, in a shocking state of repair. The light in the window is flickering, most likely an oil lamp, certainly no, not electric. And you didn't notice the fact that there might have turned you back anyways. There's no telephone line going into the house. As you climb the steps to the, foul f to the front door, little do you realize what fate has in store for you. Tonight is going to be a night to remember. Now turn over. Spooky. You climb the creaking steps up to the front door and pause to catch your breath. Even though you ran all the way up the drive from the car, you are soaked through. Your feet are particularly wet. Judging by the number of puddles you stepped in into, the into in the dark, the drive needs a small fortune spending on repairs. But under the porch, you are out of the, out of the storm. You brush the rain from your clothes before turning towards the door. The rain is still pelting down, but an eerie silence hangs in the air. No lights are downstairs. You step back off the porch to check up the stairs window, which attracted your attention earlier. Nothing. No lights. The whole place seems to be deserted. But then you remember the time. Five minutes to midnight. Everyone in the house probably has gone to bed. An owl hoots in the distance and a shiver runs down your spine. The situation is a little scary. Here you are, in the middle of nowhere, at some strange, run-down old house about to wake up whoever lives inside at midnight. They certainly won't be too pleased, but you have no choice. If you're going to make your appointment tomorrow, you must reach a telephone to call for help. Again, 870s, jolly old England, no cell phones. You step, up, you step up to the front door. From the left-hand side of the house, a dull glow catches your attention. A light has been turned on. You breathe a sigh of relief. At least someone is awake. You consider your options. There is an elaborate knocker in the middle of the door and a bell pull hanging down on the right. Will you rap on the door with the knocker? Or will you pull the cord? Alternatively, you could creep around the house to investigate the light. Hmm. Choices, choices, choices. Do we want to do the polite thing and just knock? Do we want to wake everyone in the house? Or do we want to sneak around the back? Now, since this is my first Let's Play, um, I'm just gonna do the quote-unquote what you're supposed to do and learn through your mistakes option, which is just knock on the front door. Uh, but yeah, if I was actually playing this now, I would do the creeping around the back, because, you know, hindsight and all that. A few moments later, a door handle turns slowly and the door opens. Standing in the doorway is a tall man, dressed in a dark suit with tails. His long face is solemn. Yes, he asks indignantly. <clears throat> you smile nervously and explain your situation. Your car is broken down, you need to reach a telephone, and you're soaked in to the skin. The man's face remains expressionless. Come in, he orders. The master is expecting you. Follow me. He leads you to a reception hall and tells you to sit down while he informs the master of your arrival. You sit down in a solid carved chair and look around. The reception hall is certainly not what you would have expected from the outside. It is elegantly decorated with rich ta tapest tapestries and fine oak panels. A number of portraits line the walls. A sturdy 16th century table is set against one wall. Will you wait for your host to arrive, or will you study the paintings? Alternatively, you can hunt for a telephone. Well, I will do the polite thing and wait for my host to arrive, but I will check out the paintings. Three portraits are particularly interesting. Will you look at the beautiful young woman wearing a tiara? Or will you look at the middle-aged, portly gentleman wearing half-moon glasses? Alternatively, you could look at the elderly woman with gray hair in a cold expression. Hmm. Let's look at the young woman at the tiara. A plaque, ben a plaque beneath the painting reads, Lady Margaret of Danvers, 1802 to 1834. 
You stand and admire her beauty and wonder why she died so young. As you're standing at her face, staring at her face, you suddenly blink and look again. Didn't you just see her lips moving? Surely not. A whisper reaches your ears, but you cannot make out the message. You lean forward and put your ear to the lips. A soft woman's voice is speaking to you. Stranger, beware of this place, for it is cursed. Many have succumbed to its power, myself included. The evil Lord Kelnor will already be plotting your death. Drink not his white wine, or if you can, be gone. Escape while you may. You step back, aghast. What sort of place is this? A creepy, rundown old building filled with priceless antiques and paintings which talk? A cold prickle runs down your neck and you gain one fear point. Will you now run for the door? Or will you wait to see what happens? So, uh, yeah, avoid drinking the white wine. Lord Kelnor will be plotting my death. Um, so yeah, uh, when you look at the paintings, there is no wrong answer. Um, all three of the paintings give you a clue. So, uh, yeah. Okay, um, hum. Well, I'm assuming running for the door won't do much. So let's just see what happens. Well, hmm. You know what? Let's do the ex what is expected option, which is run for the door. Well, hmm. Yeah, fuck it. Run for the door. You race across the door and twist the handle. Ah! You stifle a scream and release the handle immediately as an electric shock runs up your arm. You lose two stamina. Oof, I don't remember that happening. Footsteps. Someone is coming. The tall man you met earlier walks in, opening the door for another tall man, dressed in the red smoking jacket. May I present Lord Kalnor, the Earl of Drun Drummer, the butler announces. The Earl holds out his hand and you shake it. His grip is strong and his eyes pierce yours. His lips widen to a soft smile. You begin to tell him of your predicament, but he holds up his hand. Please, I can see that you have been caught in this filthy storm. Let us sit by the fire, and we will... When, ugh, and we will see whether we can help. Flankins, tell the cook to prepare some food for our visitor. You protest that you did not wish to be any trouble. But your host ignores you and leads you into a drawing room where a fire is burning. You take off your coat and sit down. The heat of the fire makes you feel comfortable once more. Franklin returns with two glasses of brandy. Will you relax and drink the brandy and ask if you can use the telephone? Or will you wait to see if what, he's, what he asks you by turning to page? Whatever. Um. Um. Let's ask to use the telephone. The fire and brandy warm you and you begin to feel more relaxed. You lose one fear point. You explain to the Earl what happened on the road and that you would like to use this telephone to call the Alka Garage. I'm afraid our telephone line has come down tonight in the storm. He replies, we will have it repaired tomorrow morning. In any case, the garage will not come out here at this hour, but don't worry. You are perfectly welcome to spend the night here. I am glad for the company. Tomorrow, Franklin's will take you into town. Ah, here is Franklin's now. The butler comes back in to announce that a meal is ready. You both rise to go to the dining room. The dining room looks magnificent. A long table stretches between two fine chairs and is laid with gleaming silver cutlery. A rich red wallpaper covers the walls, and the room is lit by a sparkling chandelier bristling with candles, which hangs from the ceiling. You take your seat, and the butler moves behind you to offer some wine. Which wine would you like to drink? If you'd like to choose the white wine, or would you prefer the red? Hum. I seem to recall 
the lady painting saying that avoid drinking the white wine. So we are going to drink the red. The wine is impeccable, a fine vintage. Soup follows, and then you may choose between two di dishes of your main course. If you'd like the lamb, or would you prefer the duck? Alternatively, you could tell your host that you have already eaten and are not hungry. Well, mm, let's take the lamb. A rack of lamb is brought, is brought in on a silver platter. The smell is delicious. You both start to eat and talk. The girl asks you about your job and your reason for being in such an out of the way place in the middle of the night. In turn, he tells you about himself and his family. The Earl of Drun Drun Drummer is the last survivor of his family. His estate stretches for miles around the house. At one time, the estate was prosperous with many tenant farmers cultivating his land and providing a healthy income for his family. But things started to change. His sister died at the age of 32 under mysterious circumstances. She was found dead in a clearing the woods with strange marks on her neck. News traveled fast, and the ignorant peasants started muttering about witchcraft and black magic. In their eyes, the house was cursed. Pure superstitious nonsense, of course. But gradually, the farmers moved to new pastures, avoiding the estate. But now you have finished your meal. Franken returns. You, Franken returns to offer you fruit, cheese, coffee, and brandy. Will you take fruit, coffee, and brandy? Cheese, coffee, and brandy. Just cheese and coffee. Um, this must be a European thing. <clears throat> Fruit, coffee, and brandy. Just cheese and coffee. Um, for coffee and brandy. Frankens bring, brings them to you and you finish off your meal. Well, my friend, says the Earl, you must be quite tired now. It is well past midnight. Frank comes to show you to your room. You thank him and follow the butler out of the dining room. This way, if you please. Oh, that's the butler. He says as he leads you up a magnificent wide staircase with carved wooden banisters. A landing at the top leads to various different rooms, each with a name plaque at the door. He takes you to one which reads Erasmus Room and opens the door, wishing you a good night's sleep. The bedroom has been prepared for you. The room is not large, but a huge mirror appears to, to double its size. Crisp white sheets have been folded back on the bed, and a warm fire burns in the fireplace. The door closes as the butler leaves the room, and you walk over to the fire. Your situation is a little worrying. If you didn't get going quickly, you will never make your appointment. But if it is true that there is no phone you can use, what else can you do? Maybe you should just hang your white clothes in front of the fire and climb into bed. Or would you rather leave the room? Hmm. Do we want to snoop around? You know what? Let's be gullible and just fall asleep. The bed is warm and comfortable and you soon drift off to sleep. Strange and disturbing thoughts drift through your mind. And you wake suddenly in a cold sweat. A noise has disturbed you and you realize that it's been the sound of the door closing. You look around the room and notice a glass containing a clear liquid by the side of your bed. Someone has brought you a bedtime drink. You spring out of bed and try the door, but it is locked. Do you wish to swallow the drink that has been brought for you? Or will you try to break the door down? Hmm. Hmm. Let's drink it. The liquid has a slightly sweet taste, like water, with a spoonful of sugar dissolved into it. But your mouth is dry from your sleep, and you drink it down. You lie back, thinking about your visitor. You decide it was probably Franklin's, the butler. It was nice of him to bring you a drink, but why has he locked the door? Again, you start to feel tired, and you curl up on the bed. Your head starts to swim, and the room spins around. Too late, you realize you have been drugged. Although you try your best to fight the feeling, it is no use. Consciousness fades. You open your eyes. Your head is spinning, and it is some time before you are fully aware of the fact that your hands and feet are bound. The room you are in is empty, but you work out a plan. You hop over the window, break the glass, and use it to cut yourself free. Pulling yourself to, the, to your feet is awkward, but you manage it, and with a mixture of hops and shuffles, you arrive at the window. Outside the w wind is blowing, the, the rain against the window panes. 
Will you go ahead and smash the window with your hands? Something of a risky business, or you can still test your luck. Um. Um. Let's not test our luck here. Slashing your wrists can be quite fatal. You grit your teeth and shove bound hands against the window pane. Rope first. Your first blow is not hard enough to break the glass, so you try again. This time the glass shatters, and some large pieces fall to the floor. But your desperate actions do not leave you unhurt. You receive a nasty gash on your left wrist, which reduces the stamina by two points. I mean, we have pointy-ish. You cut yourself free and massage your wrist to get the circulation moving again. Then you walk over to the door and try it. It is not locked. You try the handle, open it a little, and look outside. The room is on the first floor landing, facing the door to the balustrade, whatever that is. And looking over the banisters, you see the entrance hall below. To your left, there are two doors in the corner of the landing, which run along to the right. If you wish to go this way, Looking to your right, the landing runs past another door and then turns to the left. And now begins the maze walking. Hmm. Um. Let's go to the right. A short distance further on the balcony, you arrive at a door with Azazel written on, on the nameplate. Alright, let's try Azazel. Although that's a big-ass demon name. Ooh, science. The door opens and you peer into the room. You quickly check that there is no one inside and are relieved to find it's empty. But it's full of clutter. It seems to be a crude scientific laboratory of some kind. A brass telescope points through the window towards the sky. Charts and mathematical tables are pinned to the f to the walls. A human skeleton hangs from, from a hook and a bench is covered with glass vials and apparatuses. They look like priceless antiques, and they were all probably made in the last century. Do you wish to investigate the room further, or would you prefer to leave the room? Well, might as well snip around, right? You step into the room and close the door behind you. A squeaking noise from one corner makes you jump, but when you walk over, you're relieved to find that the squeaking comes with three rats in a cage. You keep your eyes peeled for sounds of visitors and you, as you investigate the contents of the room. Do you wish to look through the drawers? Or perhaps you may want to examine the liquids in the vials. Or the cupboards. Um. Let's check out the liquids. At the end of the bench is a rack which holds four glass veils. And each veil contains a colored liquid. They look like the results of someone's experiment. Are you willing to risk a sip of one of these liquids? If so, which color would you choose? Again, color spelled with a U, because British. Green, red, clear, yellow. But well, this seems a little too dangerous, you may instead look through the drawers. Alternatively, you can look through the cupboards. Um, well, we know the clear one knocks you out, so... Let's go with green. Green could be poison, though. But fuck it. You take the stopper off the veil and sniff the liquid. It is out of Ready? Raising the neck to your lips, you take a sip and wait for something to happen, but nothing happens. You feel no strange effects at all. For now. Suddenly, your ears perk up at the sound of footsteps coming closer. You nip into the shadows and wait. The footsteps stop outside the door and you can hear two voices talking. Hadn't we better ask the master's permission? Maybe you're right, and we'd better get a light for the lamps. You breathe a sigh of relief as the footsteps disappear off into the distance, into the direction from which you approach the room. You decide it's best to leave before they return, and you open the door to the landing. The safest way to go, it strikes you, is away from the two visitors, who may return at any moment. If you approach this room from the left, turn to the You follow the landing until you reach another door on the right hand side. A nameplate identifies it as the Erasmus Room. Well, welcome back to where we started. Let's see if anything has changed in our room. 
You grasp the handle and turn it. The door is locked, and it looks too sturdy for you to break down. Okay, will you turn towards the door at the end of the corridor, or will you go back the way you came, carrying past the room, which you originally appeared? Um, let's not go back that way. So let's just keep going, shall we? Ooh, spooky. At the end of the corridor ahead of you is a stout wooden door. While you are considering whether or not to try the room, a noise behind startles you. You spin around, only to find the wind is rustling. Well, is rustling while hangs. There's nothing to be afraid of. You turn back and are amazed to find a faint white figure has appeared in front of you. This apparition is a young woman in her early 20s with long flowing hair. She is dressed in a white bridal dress, which has been seen better days. It is ripped and torn. You gain one fear point. Oh, thank God I have found you in time. She says, I must talk to you immediately. Come, let us go into this room. We follow her into the room. Oh, you suspect a trap and would rather turn back. Um... That could be the lady we talked to. That could also be the dude's sister. They could be one and the same. I've not played this in ages, so I don't remember. <laughs> um, you know what? Bucket, let's trust her. To enter the room, sh she passes right through the door. You, of course, use more traditional methods. You turn the handle and walk into the Apelion room. It is an elegant bedroom. Fine floor-length curtains hang along one hang along one wall. An enormous bed with lace coverings is against another wall. And opposite stands a beautiful dressing table with a huge mirror. The woman hovers in the center of the room and bids you to sit down on the bed. You coming here has been no accident. She starts. And I must warn you of the terrible dangers you will face here. This house is ruled by the master, a powerful black priest of the night named Kelnor, Earl of Drummer. I would guess that you are to be offered to the demons of Hellfire if you survive that long. Yesterday they trapped a girl, a pretty young district nurse who happened to call. She is to be offered tonight. I cannot let this devilry continue. There must be some way to be it can be stopped. If you can find the Chris knife, you might be able to defeat Kalnor, for this weapon is his only weakness. Please help me. You will probably find it in No! Quick, we are discovered. I can hear the hounds. Go! Leave the room. You stand up, she was right. You can hear barking getting rapidly closer. She motions to you, pointing at the door. You run to the door and peer outside. Nothing. The barking gets louder, and you turn back towards the ghost, who seems to be struggling with something. She is involved in a fight with two huge, ghostly Great Danes, which are snapping and clawing at her. You take a step forward, but it is hopeless. You cannot touch the beasts, and your help would have been very welcome, because the dogs are much too powerful for her. She is weakened, and, as she does so, her image fades. Moments later, she disappears completely. Satisfied with their job, that their job has been done. The two Great Danes disappear. Also, you are alone. Okay, uh, I'm. I just. I just realized it's been uh, half an hour at this point, so I'm gonna call it a wrap. Thank you for watching. I will continue this shortly.